Hello everyone and welcome to the Jeffrey Epstein Show. I'm your host, Bobby Capucci, and this is a morning update. Last night, I had Maria Farmer on the program, and I turned the mic and the show over to her and let her recount her story directly to you, the listeners. No editors, no stealth editing, and no putting words in her mouth. Everything that you heard Maria talk about was what she experienced in her own view and in her personal battle against Jeffrey Epstein and his criminal enterprise. So if you have not listened to that episode yet, that is something you're definitely going to want to go back and check out for sure. And to those of you who have listened to it and who have reached out to me via email or messages on Twitter or Facebook or wherever it may be, I'm going to try and get back to all of those emails and respond to them as quickly as possible, but there was a bunch of them this morning. So I'm going to try and get back and try and answer them as quick as possible. And what else I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a Facebook page for the podcast. That way, everybody who is interested in the story, all of the listeners, everybody can get together and use that kind of as a forum to talk about the case, talk about the podcast, talk about whatever the hell you guys want to talk about, right? So that's definitely going to happen today. I'm going to do that so we have that forum. And then that way, it'll make it a kind of more of a streamlined process for us all to stay in contact with each other as opposed to just, you know, emails here, emails there, your email getting lost in the sauce and me not responding, you know, that kind of stuff. So I'm going to set that Facebook page up later on today and I'll make sure I link it in the daily drop. Now in the next few weeks, Maria, Maria is going to join us some more uh, once a week or so and she's going to continue telling her her story. And if you listened last night, you know it was powerful. You know that for her to come forward like this, it takes, it takes a lot of guts and a lot of courage. And for all of the survivors coming forward, it is a testament to their will and the bravery that they have. Because I'll tell you folks, it is a cesspool dealing with these people. You're dealing with a lot of high profile people here who have zero problem trying to ruin your life. And we heard that from Maria herself last night, how she was on the run, living in all these small towns, being threatened by Ghislaine Maxwell, etc., etc., now, if you were to just look at Maria's story, say you have never heard this case before, right? You knew, you knew nothing about Jeffrey Epstein's case, and you just heard that podcast, you would think that this is the most crazy story in history, and there's zero chance that it could be real. But when you put all of the pieces together of this story, and you look at the whole entire thing in context, it's just another episode and another example of the way Jeffrey Epstein and his inner circle treated people. The fact that this was allowed to go on for so long after Maria came forward and outed these people is such a stain and a black eye on not only the federal government and the FBI, but on the country itself. It is absolutely disgusting that people like this are allowed to operate for decades under our noses, especially considering they were acting in such a brazen fashion. Everybody knew what was going on. Even Cindy McCain said so. So you see, folks, this is why it's important to have different platforms for people to reach out directly to the, the audience, to the, citiz the citizens, to the public, with no middleman, with no BS. So I hope that you found the interview with Maria yesterday informative. I hope that you enjoyed it. And I hope that it gives you a little bit more of an idea of the sort of people that we're dealing with when we talk about the Jeffrey Epstein criminal enterprise and the organization that was involved in all of this human trafficking. Because make no mistake, folks, this wasn't just one man doing this. This wasn't just him and Ghislaine doing this. This was a whole network of people that were involved to make sure this ran like a well-oiled machine. All these years later, all the evidence that's been provided, the fact that there's a blueprint for a RICO case here, and yet we still see no action by the federal government, 
oh, we see Berman get on TV and talk about how there's nobody safe and how Prince Andrew hasn't cooperated. Meanwhile, there is an, there's more than enough evidence to start making arrests in this case. Even say you don't have the case on Ghislaine Maxwell, you don't have all of the goods yet, or you want to build an even more ironclad case. Why wouldn't you bring in some of the lower level associates and have them start ratting on each other when they're facing down five, six, seven, eight, fifteen 15 counts of RICO that each carry 20 years? Why would you not bring them in and start the process? These are the questions that I have, and these are the questions that the federal government still has not answered. So here we are, folks, plugging away on a regular basis until we get some movement, until we see some justice in this case. We're going to be here talking about it. And if it's not Berman who's going to be the man to come in and swoop up and, and, and slap Rico on these people, my question is, which one of these attorney generals has the courage to do so? Up until, up until now, the answer has been none of them. So... We'll see going forward. That's all I can say. What we can do personally and what all of us can do in the audience and content creators, etc., etc., our job is just to keep bringing the story to the public. Just keep it in the public eye. Make sure it's in the headlines and make sure that people are aware of the incredibly disgusting and evil robber barons that would rule over us. Keep that in mind when you go to the voting booth, folks. Because I'll tell you what, come 2020 on voting day, there is going to be a revolution at the ballot box. I have a funny feeling that it's going to be a bloodbath for incumbents this next election cycle. And to be honest with you, they all deserve it. The whole entire justice system, the two-tier justice system is absolutely broken. And Congress and the Senate are the main reason. They're the ones who write these laws. They're the ones who put in these loopholes. So I, I, I truly believe that come 2020, there is going to be a major shakeup in the House. So we'll see going forward what happens in this case. But all I can tell you is this. It's super important that we hear from these survivors in their own words without any stealth editing, without any nonsense. And that is exactly why Maria was on the podcast last night. And that's why she'll be coming on several more times in the weeks to follow because it's important that you folks hear directly from her. All right, on to today's topic. We have an article from the Daily Mail and the headline is, Attorney for Jeffrey Epstein's Survivors Claims the Pedophile Threatened Him and His Family, Saying, I Have Friends in High Places, Somebody's Going to Get Hurt. This article was written by Megan Sheets, an attorney for more than 20 of Jeffrey Epstein's survivors claims that the late pedophile threatened him and his family by touting his friends in high places and warning somebody's going to get hurt. Sounds like Jeffrey Epstein, right? He was never above a good threat. He liked to threaten people. We know that Ghislaine liked to threaten people. Just typical of his criminal enterprise. Just another one of his many crimes that were committed that nobody ever stopped him for. Bradley Edwards spent over a decade fighting to bring Epstein to justice, beginning back in the mid-2000s when he, representative, when he represented survivors in the first sex abuse case against the pedophile in Florida. The attorney whose book Relentless Pursuit, My Fight for the Victims of Jeffrey Epstein came out last month, appeared on a live stream for the New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children on Tuesday and revealed that at one point Epstein hired people to sur surveil his wife and sons. And we've heard that several times about Epstein and Epstein's lawyers especially. We know that Dershowitz loves that stuff. And we know that the rest of Epstein's legal team was not above that. They, had, they hired people to go and dig through investigators' trash to try and find dirt on people that were investigating them. So while the investigators, the, the local police department, were engaged in a sting operation basically on Jeffrey Epstein, Epstein was running a counterintelligence operation against them. Edwards also described the threatening call he received from Epstein after the pedophile filed a civil racketeering lawsuit against him in 2009. Isn't that something, huh? Epstein's filing racketeering lawsuits, a civil racketeering lawsuit against somebody else? 
Buddy, you're the king of racketeering. The only person involved in more racketeering than you was John Gotti. In that suit, Epstein charged that Edwards had lied about the sex abuse described in the initial case because he wanted to bring more money into his law firm. He called me to tell me, look, I don't like the way you're prosecuting me, and I don't like the way you're trying to undo my immunity deal, Edwards said on the live stream. This is typical for Jeffrey Epstein. This is the kind of thing that he would always do. He'd try and flex on people, he'd try and contact them, and then he would use his enablers, aka his so-called friends in high places, to try and put the screws to people. So people would understand that it's not only Jeffrey Epstein who you're crossing, you're crossing all of my powerful friends that are hanging on that wall in pictures. Every single person whose picture was on that wall was used by Jeffrey Epstein as leverage to do what he wanted you to do or else you would face the penalties and the consequences of crossing him. You have to understand that I have friends in high places. I will drop my lawsuit against you if you will drop everything that you're doing against me. This is what Epstein says to Edwards. So he's trying a little quid pro quo here, right? You drop everything you got going on and I'll drop my lawsuit into you and everything will just be perfect. But really what he was trying to do here is flex on Bradley Edwards and try and uh, intimidate him into dropping the case and moving on with his life. It's not worth it dealing with me. If you deal with me, there'll be people following your family, etc., etc. The typical MO of people like Epstein... Epstein eventually dropped the lawsuit before Edwards countersued for malicious prosecution, claiming that the case was meant to intimidate him and his clients. That's exactly what it was. And that's why Epstein dropped it. He knew that he was already in hot water. He knew that this, wouldn't, this wasn't going to work, but what he tried to do was intimidate Edwards. He tried to use it as a weapon against Edwards to make Edwards do what he wanted. And that was just typical of Jeffrey Epstein and those who worked for him. For the next nine years, Edwards used the countersuit to gather information on Epstein. The case was set to go to trial in 2018, offering Epstein's accusers a chance to testify against him, which had been taken away from them years earlier due to the plea deal he was given by then U.S. Attorney Alexander Acosta. And we all know the story about Acosta. We all know that he was a limperist. We all know that he was a non-factor. We all know that he went his head was uh, held under the water by the intelligence agencies here. We all know he has no power. We all know who the true pro uh, power brokers are in this case and elsewhere. But right, bu but right before the trial began, Epstein and Edwards settled the case for an undisclosed amount. Edwards at the time said that he settled because he wanted, he wanted the survivors to be able to share their stories in federal court. It makes sense, right? He wants these... He, Edwards is working towards having these survivors get their, their, their stories down into the record books, right? They, they want, he wants it to go on record in federal court. And if, if settling his suit was going to help facilitate that and make it happen a little bit quicker, then that's what he was going to do. Epstein issued an apology through his lawyer, which read in part, the lawsuit I filed was my unreasonable attempt to damage his business reputation and stop Mr. Edwards from per pursuing cases against me. It did not work. So that was Epstein's apology issued through his lawyer. So he was basically admitting, look, I effed up here. This, this wasn't a, uh, the proper channel to go after you. There was no way that it was going to work. So I guess I have to come out and admit that I was wrong so I don't get the pantsuit off of me in return. So that's the kind of legal wrangling you see going on there. In July 2019, Epstein was hit with a slew of new sex trafficking and abuse charges involving dozens of underage girls. He pleaded not guilty and was found dead of an apparent suicide in his Manhattan prison cell in August. Well, there you have it, folks. Another story from Bradley Edwards of intimidation. Another story of Jeffrey Epstein flexing his political and social muscle to try and bend people to his will to do what he wanted them to do. And he was so used to getting his way that when Bradley Edwards pushed back against him, Epstein did what he always did and what all of these, what all of these people always do. They resort to trying to sue you. They'll try and litigate you to death because they know they have fatter pockets than you. But in this case, 
He went after somebody who is well-suited to defend themselves, well-suited to fight it out in court if it comes to that. And you see the result. See, bullies don't like getting punched back in the face, folks. If you punch back at a bully and you punch a bully in the nose, they go and look for an easier target. And that's exactly what happened here. Epstein moved on from Bradley Edwards. He understood after the decade-long battle that Edwards wasn't going to budge, that Bradley Edwards was not going to be intimidated, and he had to go, he had to go ahead and cancel the suit when all was said and done because he understood that his intimidation tactics were not going to work this time. And what this article does, it shows you once again that Epstein was a master a master at bending people to his will by using his political ties, his money, and the fact that he was tight with all sorts of super powerful people. That was how Jeffrey Epstein operated. That was Jeffrey Epstein's MO. And that was how he conducted himself whenever he felt like he should crush somebody. He would go all out, folks. And that's what this article just shows us again. Just another example, right? Just another piece to the puzzle, like I always say here. Another, some more context to the story to see just exactly who we're dealing with. And this story here is just another example of the way Jeffrey Epstein conducted himself. All right, folks, if you'd like to conduct, uh, contact me, you can do that at B-O-B-B-Y-C-A-P-U-C-C-I at ProtonMail.com. That's Bobby Capucci at ProtonMail.com. You can also find me on Twitter at B-O-B-B-Y underscore C-A-P-U-C-C-I. All right, folks, I will be back later on with the Daily Drop. I hope you all have an amazing day.